connecting to the recording service, recording. All right, great. All right, well, welcome everybody. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, this is kind of a, a repeat of the presentation I made at the CCO All Hands meeting. It was mostly geared toward data producers and, uh, and NSF. So some of this may be a little repeat for the data managers but we'll go through that stuff kind of quickly. So you all know about our project and our purpose and our team. So we'll move through that kind of quickly. Um, and I'm just going to remind you all the goals of CZO Science are to develop uh, a unifying theoretical framework and coupled systems models uh, to to understand how critical zone services respond to uh, human forcings, climatic forcings, and tectonic forcings. And what was realized really early on was that data sets, really rich data sets, were absolutely key to doing this. And this was described in a, in a white paper that a pile of CZOPIs and other investigators authored back in 2010, and it was done specifically for a uh, a National Research Council report on the future of, sci of geosciences, so it got in there. And a lot of CZO scientists kind of forget that really from the very beginning of the critical zone program, NSF, the very first NSF solicitation said that the CZOs would adhere to common data management policy and common data management tools. So the language str only was, was almost identical in both but it strengthened. It went from anticipated to expected. And um, that expectation is, is really in response to something that had been coming down the pipe for quite a while, which was an executive, uh, a, a, federal, a federal mandate that was expressed here as an executive order in 2013 for open data. So all, all uh, uh, federal agencies have to come up with a plan for open data. And, uh, and NSF has been slowly working toward that plan. They realize that, that to actually get to the, the end of this, this vision requires that it's easy for scientists to submit data. And so that's why NSF has invested in this project. So the first CZO data project was really modestly funded. Um, actually, half of that went to just um, helping the original three CZOs that were funded in 2009 uh, hire data managers. Uh, the other half went to just creating a, a really bare bones system that might begin that process. Another project was funded quite a few years later for the Observations Data Model 2. I think a bunch of you have heard about that. That project um, just officially completed, and I'll give you an update of where we're at with that and how far we've come since May and also what remains to be done. Uh, we were funded with an EarthCube workshop, and that workshop was really very successful and led to um, additional funding. Uh, we finally got the second phase of the CCO of, of funding directly applicable to supporting critical zone observatories and their data managers. That money finally came into place last March, um, and it's a two-year project that's ending quite soon, actually, so we're all scrambling to get you the products. Uh, that we've been talking about now for those two years. And then lastly, straight out of the EarthCube domain workshop, um, a team of us that included almost everybody from the CZO Data Project plus a pile of other people were funded through the Scientific Software Integration Program for uh, a project that we, that we call Bio Integration with GEO for Critical Zone Sciences. So it's a, it's a software integration project that's also about integrating data uh, from multiple domain, scientific domains, basically the big gulf. There's a big gulf that exists between bioinformatics or biodiversity informatics and, and uh, geoinformatics. So, so that's a pretty substantial investment that we're uh, also uh, well on the way through. And then lastly um, is the EarthCube initiative, which all of you have heard a pile about. and. And NSF realized how incredibly important it was to get data software to enhance data management, data integration, data analysis for, 
for modeling and, and, and theoretical advancement for all of the earth sciences that really in the earth sciences, the, the challenges were the largest because of the large societal need, but also because the data were so heterogeneous. So there's an enormous investment going on in EarthCube, and it's worth noting that the team of people on the CZO data project have been really integrally involved with the EarthCube project. Uh, Kirsten Leonard, Ilya Zaslavsky, uh, people laugh because those two individuals are like co-PIs on something like between the two of them, probably half of all EarthCube funded projects. It's just a st a stunning. Um, and they're part of the CZO data project. And, and the, let's see, yeah, I, I proposed this idea that critical zone science and our data integration efforts were actually a pilot for EarthCube. And when I first proposed the idea in the proposal for the workshop, I think there was a lot of, um, you know, people were like, what? But we had really what was recognized as one of the more successful EarthCube domain workshops, I think, though there were several good ones, but um, out of the two dozen that were funded, ours definitely stood out. And since then, um, repeatedly, our team has gone to EarthCube all hands meetings, for example, like the one in June, um, governance meetings, et cetera. And in the contributions, the insight we have from working with all of you, really shines through and people say, oh yeah, you guys know what you're talking about. You've dealt with these issues before. So so we had quite a quite a long, long list of deliverables. All of you have seen it um, at the uh, IMC meeting that we had at the Stroud Center in May of this year. And what I what I really wanted to highlight to um, to all the scientists at the all hands meeting is that one of the, the core bits of wisdom that we realized, and I think almost nobody else realized, was that there really needed to be a new type of information model before software and infrastructure could be developed because it was the information model that um, underlies the, you know, the, the data servers, the catalogs, the client software, and the transmission of that data between these different software components, that was absolutely critical. So, you know, at each one of these components, one needs an information model, and the system works best um, when that information model is shared. And that, that did not exist before, even within Quasi, that was all developed by nominally the same team, uh, they were developing somewhat asynchronously or, or separately, I should say. And in the end, the information model for the catalog for Hydro Desktop Client and for the ODM2 data server was in the end different. And so there was lo information loss between them. And then to try and, and sync data from Quasi with uh, data from EarthChem was really challenging because there wasn't a common information model. So we, as a team, put in an enormous investment in ODM2. So you all know this because you've heard this before. So this is where um, I want to show you the progress that you haven't seen because when we convened in May, a lot of the work was still in progress. So I'm going to escape from PowerPoint here and go to a web browser where I'm going to finish most of this talk. Uh, let's see, that's the one. So, of course, many of you were involved with helping develop the CZO National website over time, and uh, and you all know that in the spring before our IMC meeting, uh, David Lubinsky worked with many of you to kind of reset the navigation for the new website to incorporate the new CZOs, and there was a lot of effort put in with the new CZOs to develop the the rich content. Uh, I guess that's still under construction. Um, I don't know which one of these is, one of the new CZOs is uh, most functional. But anyways, the new CZOs are mostly online and uh, and all that's good. So, so it was only near the end of the spring that we were able to get to actually what David was originally funded for um, with the CZO data program, and that is to take, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know, I guess I'll go to, I don't I should probably go to Christina's because I'm most familiar with our data set, to take the data sets that uh, we all decided would be the easiest way to load up into uh, a web system, right, for 
for re relatively um, rich searches and metadata descriptions so that people could browse between data sets from one observatory to the next and use these various links to be able to see uh, the, the cross tagging that we that we developed to uh, to browse between uh, you know the different CZOs in a homogeneous way. So 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 the jo the job was was to take this information and put it into uh, take it out of the the uh, just the web browser environment and actually turn, put it into a data catalog because right now this isn't a data catalog. It's very nicely browsable, but it doesn't have those power features. So that was an enormous amount of effort. So you all know how there are these extensive web forms behind these. Oh, by the way, the, the first thing that had to happen was actually uh, in the beginning of the summer was not only did David have to do a lot of work to get these 10 CZOs um, listed in terms of the new use, a new streamlined user interface, but the performance of the server of the of the web system really he, he fell through the floor when we had went from six to ten CZOs, and it was really going to fall through the floor if uh, the new CZOs were loading data pages. So there was a lot of behind the scenes work that happened in the early summer to make the 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 CMS uh, perform a much better under a higher load of of lots of new. Uh, uh, CZO is loading up lots of new data sets. And so we asked you in May to all be patient and uh, hold off on loading new data sets, at least the new CZOs, hold off on unloading new data sets. But we're pleased to say that basically since September or so, uh, all those performance issues have been solved. And so the, the doors are now open for loading new data sets. And I think a lot of you noticed that David gave a, a special, um, had a special web meeting recently with the data managers from the new CZOs to, t to show them how to load up data and into uh, into these data set into these data set pages all right so so anyways the, so we have the data sets here they're all different types of file types this I guess is just a link to another uh, another resource but what we what we did is that we mapped the metadata that's behind each one of these tabs and um, map them to an international format that happens to be called ISO for International Standards Organization um, 19115. It's a metadata format for groups of data files, which is exactly what our CZO data sets are. And we mapped the data from the website to that and created an automated system to generate XML files that could that were ISO 19115 compliant that could be um, cataloged in a geoportal data catalog. Now, I don't know if you saw even a prototype of the new search.criticalzone.org. You might have, but the short story is that it's fully functional. So all the data sets that are now loaded into the uh, the website via the CMS now show up here in an Esri geoportal with a really nice user interface that's quite easy to browse and do power searches on and also has um, uh, application programming interfaces for machine to machine communication. So this is very cool. So you can see here that uh, there are categories for the data sets. There are 1,067 resources and growing. I'm not really sure David can maybe answer how quick, how often the syncing happens, but it's relatively frequently. It's at least daily, right? Uh, it, yes, it's going to be daily. I, I'm not totally sure it's working right now. I, um, Tom's been playing around with some stuff, but that's the mm -hmm. vision anyway. It should be soon. So, so this is a faceted search in which um, you can actually tag uh, two, you know, two or more at a time, and you end up with an or, right? Or excuse me, an and statement where where you can quickly find um, what's at Shale Hills and Lucio, for example, and even add facets such as um, 
as as crossing over to disciplines, right? So if we look at if we untag the observatories, we can see all the, all of our 16 discipline tags that we've been using, and so one could find out, okay, well, out of the biogeochemistry data sets, um, is there, you know, do all the CCOs have biogeochemistry data sets? No. Um, so this is really a high level ability to just find out what's out there, right? All of them have climate and meteorology. Uh, do any do any are any of them shared, right? Does Christina have something that's shared with Shale Hills? No. So, so in addition, of course, those data sets show up. Oh, well, we have these faceted searches between observatories, disciplines, and also collections. So at the bottom, if we only enable the collections, you can see that there are 2,008 collections. And a collection, excuse me, uh, there are different types of data that are in here, and one of them are the CZO data sets. And if we look at the CZO data sets, these are one-to-one -one matches with what we have over at, uh, over here, right? So let's see here. This is, if I click on that, this is Sierra Flux Tower. So if I go over to Sierra. You could also use the link that's that search dot, and it'll take you right to the page. Oh, thank you for reminding me. That's right. So right over here, I can immediately go right back to the CZO data set. That is a one-to-one -one match. There are all the information here and all the links to these files. It's a one-to-one -one match with what is listed here. I can see the XML of the ISO 19115 metadata profile if I want to use that XML for some other reason. Right, so that XML is also available. All the same information. So the XML is actually generated by the um, by the by David Lubinsky at the Content Management System. So this is the way in which we export that information uh, in a way that can be readed by any federated uh, geo um, geo catalog, uh, essentially that 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 supports ISO 19115, and it's an international standard, so all of them support it. So we have those data sets, but as you know, the data sets themselves are individual files. And in the case of this one, those individual files are, are uh, contain display files. So, so we may be able to, for example, uh, zoom in and we can also add in a keyword. What, what were we looking at? We were looking at Flux Tower from P301. So we can put in flux. No, that didn't work. Why didn't that work? So what happens when you? All right. Well, I'm going to dial back here. Hmm. I see. You know what? I bet the word flux tower isn't actually tagged with on the on the on the, at the display file level. So I'm just getting the data set here, but I could uh, type in P301. I bet that's in there. Yeah, there we go. So there's a display file for that one. So the point is, is that we have, we have also our display files directly access. And when you click on, and when you get the display file, you actually can click directly on the display file tab and get the display file. Um, uh, that's just giving you the header information. We're going to have to fix that one. Oh, is that because that is the header? Let's see what this is. That, this may be, I don't know if that's a whole. If, that's a, if that includes the data or not, it just might be the header file. Oh, it does include the, the data. Oh, no, it doesn't. It is just the header file. So we're going to have to fix that. But anyways. So the intent, though, is, uh, is that the data will be directly uh, available, and so will the metadata in XML. So. Um, so because it's in a geoportal, so this is a nice search user interface for the geoportal, 
Um, but the geo portals have a whole bunch of benefits, and one of them is that they can be federated. And what that means is that we can connect our catalog to other GeoPortal catalogs. And the one that we have connected to as an example is open topography. Um, and we can essentially look at uh, what's in open topography's catalog for the HEMES, for example. So these are coming straight out of op the open topography catalog, um, but are there links to HEMES? But we can also look at what everything else that's in open topography's catalog. Another benefit is that there are, are these application programming interfaces, and we and and uh, Tom Whitenack has taken some time along with David to describe what these are. So the power users of the world, um, some of which uh, include you, um, or you you are part of that group too, can access some of these different uh, web services um, uh, APIs. So it's all right, right, described right here. And then this about page is just kind of general information, but I think there's some how-to information in here in, in addition uh, to kind of acknowledgements and other things. So anyways, that's our data portal, and, that's, and, that's, uh, and we plan on enhancing it. This isn't the final product, but this is where we've gotten in the, um, over the course of the summer. So, uh, it's 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 basically functional. We're we're refining it and um, and adding to it. Any questions so far? This is meant to be a discussion or Q and A period. No, but I do have a clarification, uh, kind of for the earlier steps of the process. Um, yeah. You know, you had mentioned Anthony that about clearing up a lot of the performance issues, and I wanted to make it. Um, uh, make the point that I'm still working on that. It's better than it was um, at, this is just for uh, criticalzone.org and working with the CMS. Um, we're definitely in better shape, but there's one kind of big bug that I'm working on still now. Um, and that's when you're on the, you're in the admin control panel, working on data sets, moving between tabs and loading up pages is still really slow. Um, and hopefully I can get that one fixed so that the actual process of, of working in your data sets in the CMS is not slow. So stay tuned, uh, hopefully, for a big improvement there. Awesome. All right. Any other questions? You can type in the chat box if you want. So you can go up to the you can go up to the green bar at the top of your screen and click on participants. You can unmute yourself. I got most of you muted yourself before I started screen sharing, so I just want to remind you where you can unmute yourself. Well, you can also unmute yourself right here at the green bar, uh, but also at the participant list, and then there's a chat box, so you can type in questions into the chat if you want, and I'll keep an eye on the chat box. All right, no questions? All right. So the next thing that we talked about delivering was the CZO data visualization portal. And um, it's, uh, it's designed to peer in at a subset of the data, the data uh, and in particular the data that gets loaded into the quasi, uh, into the quasi um, Hydrological Information Center uh, system, which is moving to the hydro, to the Quasi Water Data Center, it's actually in progress right now, or mostly done, um, and also eventually data that gets loaded up into Aida EarthChem. So this is a system that will allow one to have map-based discovery of those uh, of those locations. So. So anyways, the way it's set up is that, you know, there's obviously a tab for each of the CZOs. It's built upon um, a, web, a web visualization system called Visor that was originally developed for a marine uh, project in the Pacific Northwest. But, but anyways, I'm going to just do a little browsing to some of the other CZOs. So, uh, oh yes, now I remember. This was set up, okay, so what was done for Sierra was set up completely in a demo site, so that's not this one. Um, so actually the most active one is probably Christina. A little bit was done for EEL. So next week, Emilio Mayorga is going to have a WebEx with all of you 
um, to show a lot more of the features of this system and um, and to actually solicit information from you because for for him to populate up uh, the site like like we have here, he needs some shape files um, and uh, some site lists and some other things from you all. And he's gotten some of that from both EO River and Southern Sierra just because of uh, some uh, opportunities that were that were really easy to to use for demos. Uh, I'm going to change these settings to global and local. And then and then, and then just kind of remind you what's possible here. So so I think you've all seen demos previously where where the system is designed to allow you to click on a point and see what's measured there. This is a USGS station. It's being pulled into the system via Quasi HIS, even though it's a USGS data. Uh, you can see all the different parameters and have really nice fast visualization download the data um, all from uh, from this web browser. But really, the power is not just accessing the data, but it's also um, being able to do kind of power searches of the data, right? So I can do a keyword search and type in, um, you know, I can, I, can, it, I can do a fasted search and figure out where there's dissolved auction data um, and also pH data. So, uh, so that faceted search occurs a little bit like what you saw before, or I can do a free text search and just say, um, you know, where are all the sites that were uh, developed by the Stroudwater Research Center and get a quick picture of the of those, or um, uh, or something else. Let's see if I click on the platforms, I can see that there are some uh, NOAA plat platforms. Um, and find out where all the streams that are named run are located, right? So there's there's lots of capability with the searching, and the last little bit that I wanted to show you is that is that any data that gets in the Quasi HIS can be loaded up here, right? So that's the beauty of this, right? We're we're actually harvesting data from the Delaware Earth Observing, uh, excuse me, Environmental Observation System, and this is. Uh, uh, a system that's based, that's uh, really just Delaware specific, but we convinced them to um, develop a, a, a web service to Quasi, and so we can access their data from that. And then most recently, which I'm very proud of, uh, we have at the Stroudwater Research Center developed uh, some open source sens sensing uh, devices that are now um, streaming live data into Quasi HIS that we're picking up, um, uh, and that and we can pull into this client. So any live streaming data that you have that you can get into Quasi HIS through a web service, we can visualize. And so I think there's a lot of potential there. This specific site, um, we're loading up to uh, to our own uh, kind of home homegrown uh, web system. You know, these are these open source things that I think some of you saw out in our stream here, um, but but not only is it going up to our own website, it's it's going up to uh, Quasi. Last, our plans are that not only will we be able to find data sets where we have, actually I should zoom back into here, um, not only will we be able to find, you know, Quasi data sets, but we also are very interested in exposing all sorts of other types of data sites, right? So this is a soil pit. We can put any type of site information here, and right now there's no visualization of the data, um, the soil data from this pit, but the intent is that we will develop um, some connections with AIDA EarthCam where we might be able to show soil profiles for different parameters, right? So that's something that we're going to try and deliver by March, is actually uh, an equal ability to visualize um, uh, data series that are prof soil profiles of geochemistry, for example, or maybe other simple data series and have that visualized, in, even if it's not a live data set, in addition to these live data data feeds. And a uh, quick, quick question, Anthony. Mm -hmm. um, so it, is there, um, I'm, I'm curious if for, you know, for, for site-based, you know, 
data series that are not streaming, not live, are, are there some automated ways that are being thought about uh, so, you know, things are synced from somewhere? I'm, I'm a little lost on the kind of the big picture. Yeah, so that is exactly what's going to happen. We're, what we're hoping is that that the this is a free text search. So, so what we're hoping is that the display files, which get ingested into Quasi HIS automatically, the old CZO display file version one, that with the CZO display file version two, that will have a soil profile. Um, uh, a soil chemistry profile or a geochemistry profile of the CCO2 display file version 2, and that will get automatically harvested into AIDA EarthChem. Um, they're developed, they're, we're, we're moving forward on some of that work, and then that would then become automatically exposed in, uh, you know, in the visualization portal. So that's the idea. Okay, just so a lot of it, it hinges on display file 2, version 2. It, it does. And, and well, the AIDA EarthChem is just one example of what would be possible once version 2 gets in place and ODM2 gets in yep. place. Yep. Okay. Thanks. That makes sense. Yeah. And we hope to deliver some soil profile visualization by March. Um, we probably won't be able to get much beyond that, but at least we'll use that as a demo of what's possible. In fact, that's all we promised in the, uh, in the proposal. So. So let's see here. Yeah. yeah. So I think those are the the main demos that I did of uh, of the kind of the the web interfaces. But I'm going to spend a little uh, the main uh, the main demos that I did to the all hands meeting. But I'm going to spend a little bit more time with you all describing the progress that we've made with ODM two. So just as a reminder. You can keep track of the ODM2 project through GitHub, uh, and uh, specifically the Utah Center for Hydrologic Information and Commuting. Jeff Horsborough is uh, uh, the lead on that team, um, and he's got all sorts of things going on. ODM2 is one of those projects, but if you type in ODM2, you'll find it. And these are GitHub-y kind of views of the links. You have to browse down below to the README file. Um, and one of the things that we've done we're slowly moving forward. I think you've seen before that if you want to see what the data model looks like, uh, you can look at the entity relationship diagrams and see, you know, kind of these visual representations that are all hyperlinked of how the tables are connected and what the structure of ODM2 is, uh, and really a lot of detail information about really what what each item is. So it's really has an enormous amount of information there. But in addition to that, we have these documentation pages that we've really spent quite a bit of time developing that describes in really very, uh, quite a bit of detail how we plan on using uh, each of these tables and what things mean. So this talks about how actions work. There's a, uh, you know, some diagrams about related actions and how you create related parent-child relationships between different types of actions. And so there's all these examples here. Um, you know, for, so a concept like actions, which is actually new to ODM2, we've, uh, we really detail with a lot of examples. So, so we had some of that back in May, but we've expanded on the documentation. It's better and it's getting close to complete. But one of the main things that we've done is actually at the very top here is like how to get started. We have created um, SQL scripts that allows one to automatically generate an ODM2 database for any of these three main um, data management systems. Uh, so it's really relatively painless to now create your own ODM2 database. And uh, in addition to that, Oh, we've also have these data use cases where we actually allow you to download these two ODM2 databases and play with them. Let's see, there's this, uh, we haven't yet built a lot of documentation about the next thing we're doing, and that is the, we're developing an application programming interface for ODM2 
which is a whole pile of Python scripts that allows us to build software. We're primarily doing this for us so that we can build all, all sorts of software on top of it. And um, the software that we're talking about building are, th are really going to be part of this big CZ uh, scientific software integration project, but they include things like ODM tools in Python so that you can do time series data management uh, around using an ODM2 database. And so all that is is slowly on its way. A lot of you asked in May, how can I get started with ODM2? And we said, you can be patient and we'll help you out. And, and this is just a little bit of an update that we're getting a lot closer um, to really being able to help you out. You know, we didn't have a lot of these automated, like create an ODM2 database, right? We didn't have uh, software that would allow you to use um, simple Python code instead of complicated SQL statements to load data into it with the database. Um, so lots of good stuff going on with ODM2. It's cranking forward quite rapidly. The, the, the another thing that I didn't mention really to the, to the, uh, at the all hands meeting was the work on ODM2 control vocabularies. You may remember that, that uh, ODM2 control vocabularies, well, ODM2 itself was being adopted both by Quasi for their new water data center infrastructure. The first thing they had to do is port everything over uh, from the existing infrastructure from San Diego to uh, the new water data center. That's been accomplished. And uh, in including merging all the CZO controlled vocabularies uh, into ODM, into Quasi controlled vocabularies. So as of about a month ago, um, the two are merged and one-to-one, -one, and anything that is in Quasi's control vocabulary uh, it should, so Quasi's control vocabulary should be considered the, the, the main control vocabulary for CZO Display File version one. But really what's hap going to happen next is Water Data Center and AIDA, EarthChem, uh, are implementing ODM2 as their new core information model around their new cyber infrastructure, and this is going to be at least a year-long process. The new ODM2 control vocabularies are going to take over. So we've been working really hard on each of these control vocabularies. Um, we have put in a lot of care and effort into developing these. Um, we drafted them all out in uh, Google Docs. But where they're heading is into an ontology registry and repository that allows machine-to-machine -machine communication um, for each of these terms so that the terms, each of the terms themselves are, um, can be exposed using all this machine language like RDF uh, and XML, et cetera, which I guess I won't open up that file. Um, so. So this is actually really cool. Quasi did not have such a robust software system to do machine-to-machine -machine communication between um, vocabularies, uh, between systems that might use vocabularies. So now, instead of saying, let's see, what am I at? I'm at a, an action type, right? So we've got an, an action type that's called estimation. Um, if I'm not mistaken, and I might get this wrong, uh, yeah, estimation. If I type that in with RDF at the end of it, uh, I might have screwed up a little bit. I had one loaded up here. Cruise. There we go. So that URL is actually points to machine readable code that um, can be read in a web browser or by a computer that uses. Um, resource definition language. What? There we go. There's the RD, RDF. That's the RDF. So the machines can can read this and really understand what this is. So the definitions and and terms and and examples are uh, can be completely transferred from one uh, computing system to another. Quasi has long needed this, and so we're we're basically implementing this for ODM2. So we're building this framework that allows um, software to be built, and that's what we need to do for the CZOs. Okay, 
so those were the two extra demos, and um, and then I want wanted to, and then I described to everybody at the CZO meeting things that were coming soon. So, whoops, sorry about that. Okay, so those things are, we're still working on the CZ IGSN registration agent. We just spent an hour today talking about that. Um, we are finalizing things like sampling feature types, site types, specimen types, sampled medium types, and other metadata terms that we would use as part of that. And in addition, um, EarthChem is developing a system that allows uh, CSAR to expand to have registration and allocation agents um, for CZOs, and they're actually using the CZO as a test case. So we'll be the first non-CSAR allocation agent, um, and that should uh, all happen this winter. We um, are still working on the CZO display file version 2, to be quite honest with you. Um, uh, there hasn't been an enormous amount of progress toward that. If you remember, it we are basically combining this concept of a CCO display file with the concept of an ODM2 archival text file. And it will have the syntax specifications of JSON and, and the schemas will be validated using uh, JSON schema, which is a whole family of software that allow machine validation of the display file so that it could be easily ingested. Um, we're we're talking about having a little mini workshop in January to really hammer out this display file thing. And uh, if any of you are interested, let us know. Um, we already have some of you in mind to invite to this uh, little mini workshop. So, um, and then of course, uh, because ODM2 is being adopted by Water Data Center and AIDA EarthChem, um, within the next year, uh, we'll have the ability to go into their web systems and find CZO data in addition to going into search.criticalzone.org. Uh, I just talked about the vocab system, and then uh, this is what I told all the investigators out there, that they need to get to know you guys, the data managers, so that you can start submitting data. The idea is they give you the data, you load it up on the content management system as a data set. Um, the data files themselves can still be kept private, but at least they're talking to you about the data and the metadata that they're producing even before they're ready to make it public. Um, so I think that that process is really important so that the CZOs get credit for the data even before it goes public. Um, and then it, re it becomes relatively simple for the, the investigator or the grad student to work with you to give that data set a, a DOI and make it public in parallel um, or synchronously with the publication of the paper so that everything goes public and becomes a, a good public record. Um, so I encouraged everyone to begin, uh, you know, really thinking about having master lists of sites and specimens because very soon we'll be having a system based on the IGSN registration uh, agent of, uh, of, of managing them internally, excuse me, uh, centrally uh, in, in addition to managing specimens. So anyways, I pointed them to our separate seminars. And I think that was it for the for the presentation. So hopefully that's a little bit of an update of what we've done this summer. Any any questions or thoughts? I'm looking at my watch and realizing that I have only a few more minutes before I need to end the call. Any questions or thoughts? Nothing. Well, for me, this is David again. It was helpful to see kind of the big picture since I wasn't at the, the meeting um, and to hear a little bit more kind of big picture update of, you know, because I, I get exposed to some of the details of where you guys are at with ODM2 and so on, but it's nice to see the kind of overview of where you're at. So thanks for that. Sure. Yeah, things are coming along quite well with ODM2. Uh, Jeff Horsborough's team has really been doing a ton of programming this summer. Um, that's really going to make a big difference to, to helping you all uh, start using ODM2 locally if you choose. Um, we're actually, you know, that project funding is over. We are in the process of writing the final report, but, but the big CZSSI project 
is basically designed around building software around ODM2. So, um, so, so there will be an ODM2, there will be a uh, big CZ toolbox, which will be an ODM2 database, ODM tools for ODM2, uh, streaming data loader, and a bunch of py uh, really easy to use Python scripts with an enhanced Python. Python library for data analysis and data publication. It's going to have some of the software components that we used to take our open source um, uh, data loggers and stream that data up into Quasi as a water one for the web service, right? So it's going to have all this stuff built into it, and um, that should be available in about a year or a year and a half. So, um, but for those of you who are game to be beta testers, we can start handing you components of that, I think, really starting this winter. Great. And I'm, I'm glad to see I hadn't really realized that OEM2 had gone from sort of, you know, this fairly complete data model spec, um, but that you've actually got implementation, you know, and adoption with Kawasi. Yeah. Yep. We did a, we had a huge ODM2 push uh, in the winter and spring and it actually came at the expense of the CZO data project, really, but but it was all laying foundations for it. Um, we we uh, and those all, and all that effort really paid off because we were totally successful at selling ODM to to multiple organizations. The primary ones is Quasi and and Aida Earthchem, but uh, a lot of other people are paying attention. So the Open Geospatial Consortium is considering. O the stuff we've done in ODM2 uh, for as ideas for their revi the revisions of their of their incredibly important observations and me and measurements uh, uh, data standard and and there's a, there's there's there are potentially lots of other people who want to use ODM2. It's kind of exciting. This is a description I'm showing on my screen of what the ODM what the Big CZ toolbox it doesn't mention ODM2 here, but basically ODM2 is all over the place. It's this relational database. Um, the web service interfaces will all be based on ODM2. Uh, I guess this stuff, you know, is, is based on what we've done here at the Stroud Center. Um, this is based on the on the CZO display file 2 that we're talking about doing, so. Good to see. That so, you know, there's the fund, funded work that builds off of that, so it keeps the momentum yeah. going. Yeah, and and Kirsten has a whole team of programmers that are all writing software around, like the entire, they're rebuilding EarthChem data system from the ground up around ODM2, and the same is happening at Quasi. It's kind of stunning, actually. And it has huge benefits for the CZO group. Anything else? All right. So I got a uh, I got some uh, a private question about it, uh, someone interested in being a beta tester for an ODM2 database, and uh, the person to contact would be uh, Jeff Horsborough and his team. So so if you go to the ODM2 uh, uh, website, uh, you can find, of course all the contributors and uh, and this nice GitHub thing shows you who are the largest contributors, mostly Jeff. I did a lot of contributing early on, but I haven't recently. But then you can see that there are all these programmers like Sarah Reeder, uh, Stephanie Reeder, I'm sorry, <coughs> is, uh, is, is, is kind of the main programmer leading some of this team. So Jeff or Sarah would be great, Stephanie, sorry, would be great people to contact. But a lot of that you can get right off of here. Another person that you might have noticed on that contribution list um, who's been contributing a bunch is Tony Castronova, who's actually a, a faculty member who just started at Utah. And he's completely 100% become part of the ODM2 project just because he's a user. He's a modeler, and he's building all of his models around ODM2. So his, the, mo the model, he, as he brings data together for his models, they go into an ODM2 database. 
and then the temporary data that, that like every time cycle of the model gets gets stored in an ODM2 database. So he's been a, a huge contributor to these API code base um, in order to uh, in order to uh, uh, and allow his modeling activities. So you can see kind of the activity. We had a huge huge push in February and March to finalize the structure of ODM2, and that really much, that pretty much got finished by April. And then everything since here, all this, all these commits and, activ and activity has all been about writing software around ODM2. Cool. Yep. So we're not quite there to have a public release. We feel like the first release of ODM2, the first kind of public release of ODM2 has to have the um, basic control vocabulary for entity types or object types in, in there, object types such as action type or sampling feature type, specimen type or site type, like those have to be defined and they have to be embedded in the database before we're ready to ship. So hopefully we're making a big push, hopefully we can do a first release by AGU, a first public release, but anybody can be a beta tester right now if you want. Easy to do. You just go here and pick your pick your flavor and get started, basically. There it is, there's your create. You just paste that into into PostgreSQL and suddenly you've got an ODM2 database. It's really easy. Anyone else? All right, sounds, I'm gonna wrap it up then. Sounds good. Uh, can I make one quick announcement, kind of yep. clarification uh, to this crowd anyway? Um, so just I'll, I'll be in touch with many of you and more, uh, a lot of the data and web people, um, as we start to connect the main website with the portal, so with the data portal, so with, you know, the CMS-driven website and the data portal um, and having interconnections back and forth. So there's going to be some interface changes and layout changes, and I want your feedback on those, especially the data and the data, some of the data sets pages. We'll be improving those. And, and linking them up and kind of explaining why you might be, why you might want to go from one data source to another. So I'll be in touch, and it'd be great if you could give some feedback uh, to some mock-ups and ideas we have for that. So stay tuned. Yeah, thank you for saying that. And and uh, just to expand on that a tiny bit more, unfortunately, we are aware that these pages here. Uh, are a little bit outdated, and, and what David is talking about is basically rewriting all the content on these pages under national data. Um, in, a, in addition to maybe some of the stuff that's at the top of the main data pages, like this area in here. Exactly. Yep. So this is a better example. This shows how it filled out. You know, like how the feature data sets and the little little bit of info in here works. So. Um, so yeah, we want to improve. We we understand that the content at the national level is not great, um, but also the navigation isn't great either. So we're, we're that's kind of uh, the next thing that David's going to work on now that the ISO 19115 metadata transfer from a CZO data set to the geo portal at search.critical.org is all working. Now that that's all working, that's that's kind of the next thing that David's working on. All right. Thank you very much. Talk to you all later. Next Thanks week, again. same time, same place, Emilio Mayorga is going to lead. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.